When I came up with the idea of Skeleton Warriors, I wanted something to be very compelling from the moment it came on the screen. And I had this idea, that golden gleaming storyteller that appears at the beginning of the show. On Saturday morning when our show came on, it was like, these are the tales of the Skeleton Warriors. These are the tales of the Skeleton Warriors. I wanted to grab those kids. I wanted to see that gleaming CGI golden skull talking to them, saying, these are the tales. It's like saying, do not go away. Don't change the channel, right? I remember I came in on a Monday morning, and everybody was running around the office. And they're like, oh, Gary called us in over the weekend. I'm like, what is he calling you in over the weekend for? He created this new concept. You have to see it. We've been doing designs all weekend. And there were these designs starting on all of these skeletons. I looked at him, and I said, oh, my god, I think. He's come up with an amazing idea. The most memorable thing about it, I guess, would have been launching it at Toy Fair. Within a couple months, we had sold the show to Playmates. We had sold the show to CBS, all based on the strength of an idea Gary had over the weekend. And we all knew this is something that could be very, very cool. It was really the power of an idea. And then when they come back from the titles and the, and the commercial, there he is again, comes in and begins to weave a story. Light, darkness. The two sides of existence locked in an eternal struggle for the hearts and minds of the living. Each side claims its share. But what of those caught in between? Which way will they turn? I wanted them to write kind of a Rod Serling Twilight Zone thing, kind of for a kid, setting up the moral dilemma of the story you're about to see. And then at the end, coming back and commenting on it, but in a wry way, not like trying to teach, like this is the moral, no. Instead, commenting on the story and what happened, but always leaving it hanging a little bit. Like as if to say, this story is not over. So that is the little piece of the show that I always say hints at what the overall show was going to be had we been given enough time to do it. Lightstar, Grimskull, Talon, Guardian, Defenders of the Light. Keepers of the crystal, standing strong against Baron Dark's apocalyptic ambition. They are the last hope for a world in chaos. They seek to heal that which has been broken. They fight to restore order to a world out of balance. But can they? We wanted to create a show with an arc. All the characters were headed somewhere. But that made it a little challenging for, uh, for CBS. But we felt strongly that that's how we had to un unfold this story, was through this arc. In those days, we'd already had success with Captain Power. So we started looking around for an idea. We were always kicking around ideas for new shows and new things. And, uh, and I was actually playing with my godson, Lee DeLapp, who was at that time about three or four years old. Landmark did a lot of theme park shows, Conan being one of them, and it was its closing show. After 10 years, it was doing its last performance, and we wanted my son, who was about three and a half at the time, to see the show. He got to see it, and there was skeleton warriors that actually come, up, come to life. And Gary asked him, you know, you know, what are you, Lee? And he says, I'm a skeleton warrior. And, uh, Gary's, you know, what do you, what do you mean a skeleton? Are you afraid of skeletons? Gary said, you know what? I think we've got an idea here. If the skeleton figure is that powerful, and it's in my, it's, it is with me to this day from Ray Harryhausen, it's obviously with my four-year-old godson who just reacted to a skeleton that way. And it made me start thinking, there must be a story here where you could tap into that, that fascination we have with skeletons. And I realized at a very young age, they communicate on a mythic level at a very young age, just like dinosaurs. There are certain things that must be in our DNA. So I thought, let's see if we can turn that into some kind of show or idea, or into a toy line, or into both. And that's, that was the genesis, really, of the whole thing. And then I had to come up with the story that would, that would I could fit this idea around. The inherent problem is the skeletons are the villains. You're gonna do a show called Skeleton Warriors. Well, you know, but the Skeleton Warriors, in my mind, always had two meanings. Skeleton Warriors, the Skeleton Warriors themselves, but Skeleton Warriors, the guys that fight against them. Gary, his fascination with uh, comic books, superheroes, and and real dramatic stories of, of people struggling, struggling for freedom. These are the types of stories and the types of characters that Gary created for Skeleton Warriors. You know, there were some very adult themes in there. there these themes are, are, are were strong, powerful themes that I think anyone with a brother or sister had to be able to relate to the the sibling rivalry and, and how intense it got. I 
only have two brothers. I'm not looking to lose one. Then tell Justin to stop playing king! What did you do this time? Me? Yes, you, big brother. You know Josh can't stand it when you treat him like a child. Then he should stop acting like one. Ever since father... The city is my responsibility now. Joshua just can't handle that. Yes, he can. He just doesn't like it. Joshua is proud. If you push him too hard, he'll end up defying you just to show you he can. So we had very compelling dynamics and there were big stakes. I don't think you can look at any of these stories and say they're mindless, they're just things that we put up on TV for kids to watch. Quite the opposite. They all have a compelling tale, an adventure tale, but within it, there is a moral dilemma that has to be dealt with, confronted, and solved. We had developed a very elegant storyline. Gary and I are both comic book guys, and we had this really cool storyline. Once I had an idea, I created a character for each one. I created every single character in my mind, and on that one, I actually got with Neil Adams, and uh, I asked, Neil, can you, can you draw these? There was a lineup of the concept for the characters initially. That's all there was, so there was no world, no place. But looking at that, it was good inspiration and certainly kind of had some hints at what the look could be. So then you just expand and grow, and, and then talking with Gary and feeling what's the tone of the other stories. I mean, it, ultimately, these things are there to support the stories. These are some original sketches that uh, Ian McKaig did. At that time, we were thinking that the other uh, the members of the Lightstar team would draw their uh, powers from animal spirits and from the real world, nature. So here's, uh, here's Talon, and uh, of course she was, uh, had a connection to, to uh, birds. Um, and then, uh, well, of course this was what became Grimskull. At one night, time his name was Shadow. And this character remained consistent. We always knew that he was going to be the one that betrayed them and that was in between the uh, he was in between the light and the dark, in between being a human and being a skeleton. Ursac was quite different then. He was actually more of the earth and uh, drew his power from the bear. So we had a whole concept here going uh, when I was working with, uh, with Ian uh, of basically uh, heroes that were more tied to the animal world, to the spirit world, to uh, living things, all living things. And again, you're creating these stories to be kind of mythic tales for a young audience. So. Baron Dark, Light Star. I mean, immediately they know Light Star is the good guy, Baron Dark is the bad guy. I mean, it's inherent in their names and who they are, as well as their visual appearance and their characters. On the strength of that, I went to Playmates. In the case of Gary, he always went to toys first. And when you go to a toy company first, it's, it has to have that really iconic look to it that can be interpreted into products so that when they're out there selling it to their retailers, they can look at it and go, I've never seen anything like that before. That was one of his fortes, to be able to really speak the toy company language, but always maintain that creative integrity. I had met Playmates on something else, and I think I decided to take this to them, and, and they flipped right away. I mean, I had the sculpts and everything, though. I had them all sculpted out and everything. We kind of rushed in there with just the bad guys, and we show them to him and go, hey, guys, what do you think? You know. Uh, and everyone's stunned by the, you know, the maquettes, uh, the team, everything that they've created, and this is really great. And they were like, okay, we're in, you know, we gotta have a show. And uh, CBS, uh, Judy Price was uh, there, and she was in the throw of the Image Boys. Um, they were uh, considering Savage Dragon, and they were considering Wildcats, and, and um, we kind of ran in there the last minute with this whole presentation. And uh, she was like, well, I don't know, you know, Wildcats and S Savage Dragon, and it's going to be Image. And I said, well, you know, original shows do well, too. And this is original. It's, something, it's a whole new vision. To make a long story short, we got right down the wire. It was either Savage Dragon or us, and we got it. So, so I was pretty happy about that. February 1994, um, my husband, Eric Lee Wald, and another very talented writer, Len Yuley, and another very talented writer, Steve Cuden, and I uh, received a phone call that... Uh, there was a project that the good folks at CBS Studios, headed by Judy Price, were considering. Before Judy Price would agree to producing the show and going forward, they had to have a pilot. So we get a phone call saying, we need a pilot and we need it on Monday. This was Thursday. So Eric and I and Len and Steve go into a meeting with um, Stephanie um, Graziano, who was the head of Graz Entertainment. We were shown art, we had a long talk through, and we met back up at our home, the four of us, sat down with four computers. Back in 1994, they were fairly large computers, and we 
pounded that sucker out. We crafted a pilot, got it over to Judy Price at CBS Studios, and she approved. By then, the CGI had caught up. I really wanted to do that in a CGI format. But the way the networks work, they waited so late that we, could, we had to go 2D animation. Had we started four months earlier, we could have done it CGI, and I think it would have been a whole different show. When we went, we had nine months, and nine months was not enough to do all the prep work to do CGI. I wanted to bring a contemporary Harryhausen show to weekly television. So in the way that we innovated with Captain Power, I wanted to innovate with Skeleton Warriors. But the timing was just such that we couldn't. And you know, you're not gonna say no. When a network says, we're gonna pick up your show, we're gonna do 13 episodes, you, 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 you say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Back in 94, when Skeleton Warriors uh, was being produced, it's easy to forget that back then, cable TV, uh, satellite TV, had not reached maximum saturation throughout the country yet. You could still find large pockets where you only had ABC, CBS, NBC, and the young upstart Fox kids. We were also right on the cusp of, of the end of Saturday morning. I mean, Saturday morning was starting to get, you know, eaten up by all the other options that kids had on cable shows and other networks, the Fox network, and the times were changing. Today, I don't think people can imagine not being able to flip on a laptop and find whatever they wanted to watch, whenever they want to watch it right now. It wasn't like that back then. How thoughtful of you to give me the pleasure of your annihilation. Stop right there, Baron. You betrayed me. <laughs> You speak to me of betrayal, second son. Look what your misplaced pride has cost you. So desperate to rule, and now all that remains is a ruin of your own making. We went to Playmates first because they were in Los Angeles. We went down there, we met with Richard Salas. He loved the toy, he said, I'm in. Playmates was just a great company to work with. You know, just a real pleasure, and they really gave us a lot of creative control. We wanted to create a walk-around character. One of our friends, a uh, uh, costumer, was saying, hey, you know, I can make one of these skeletons walk. My guarantee was, if you give me this walk-around character, you know, at, at Toy Fair, I'll get him on CNN. I'll have him on the evening news. And uh, so they are, you better, you know. So uh, we did. We, we got the character. We, uh, the costumer, Michael Hood, actually became our puppeteer and flew out with us. Just a typical day in New York. Ours was seven, eight feet tall, very menacing. And all, when he walked there, all the cameras turned on him, and, and he certainly got the coverage that we wanted. That created a buzz. When we got to Toy Fair, we were on a verge of almost getting the, t the TV series. We didn't know if we were going to have it or not. CBS hadn't made up their mind. And so the first day, we had the character out there. We got the front page of the trade magazine the next day. And that night, we got a call. You got the TV show. The next day after we got, they heard the TV series was announced, uh, people were stopping us in the hallway. And people were catching us actually on the floors in between Toy Fair. So we're going from one appointment to the other and saying, you know that deal about belts? Here's my check. Jennifer Rogers sold dozens of licenses off the strength of the walk-around character and the sculpts. People were going nuts over this property. And the strength of the maquette brought people to this brand and said, yeah, we want in on that. There were people that really wanted to close that day. I don't know if you want to put amounts in there, but we made a really substantial amount of products um, in cash, you know, in advance, even before the product was uh, launched. Over 250 products, and we try to hit it in every category. Uh, apparel, games, electronics. Back then they say the big three was you needed the interactive, you needed the boys toy line, and then you needed the medium, the television. At my company then, it was kind of unique. We had our own in-house sculptors, we had, our own, we had our own model shop, we did figures, I mean full time. I look back now and I wonder, you know, how in the heck could I even afford that? But we did. We were the toy show with our figures, with our whole uh, line of uh, Skeleton Warriors figures. And uh, Todd was just launching his Spawn figures and uh, I was a fan of Todd's, of the comic books, and of the whole image group. Someone came up to me a little while later, and they'd come into our showroom there and at, uh, for, uh, for Playmates, and they'd seen our figures, and, and uh, they said, uh, uh, Todd McFarlane wants to know if he can you know, come take a look at your figures. And I said, yeah, sure, I guess so, yeah. And uh, okay, so we'll be down like in 20 minutes. And so they come back with Todd, and I met him, and I said, yeah, come on in. And he, and he looks at the figures, he's got his guys with him, and he goes, Oh my God, look at these figures. Look at these things. These are, these are incredible. Look at, look at the detail. And he looks at me and goes, you know, they're telling me they can't do the detail. They can't get the detail. Look, look, look. And he's holding up our skeleton figures and stuff, which are highly detailed. And uh, 
So um, to make a long story short, basically Todd was very inspired by the quality of the work that uh, our figures had, that the Playmates team, you know, in uh, Asia had done. Uh, based on our sculpts, though, of course. The Skeleton Warrior figures were the first figures with that kind of detail. The quality that we have been able to demand uh, to get from Playmates and the fact that Playmates performed and did it. Those are some of the most amazing toys ever made. And I've talked to people from other toy uh, groups that say they remember the Skeleton Warriors even now. That the commitment that Playmates made to to really create, to duplicate what Gary created with the maquettes and the sculpts is really amazing. They were sensational toys. I still have a bunch at my house. My children's friends will come over, they'll see them and say, what are those? Those are amazing. Gary, certainly I feel like we got our vision done. We hit the ground running in February 94 and are in constant contact with, uh, with Stephanie Graziano, with Gary Goddard, uh, with everyone involved in the production of the series. We have a lot of things from the good old days of Skeleton Warriors and found a file folder here with a memo to me from Gary Goddard that was dated May 10th, 1994. I'm just gonna read a little bit of this because I find it fascinating to see how these things grow and change. When I was sketching out the ideas for this show, it was originally set in today's world. It was more of a superhero style story at the time with the skeleton warriors attacking Earth and with a group of powerful heroes defending them. What I'd wanted to do was to use the skeletons as a powerful device that would serve to symbolize the wholesale darkness that kids face daily and then pit the heroes against them. Kids today live with the fact that half the world is at war, that ethnic cleansing is taking place, that top sports heroes, politicians, etc., just about everyone and everything is tainted. So the essential question is, are you part of the problem or part of the cure? That is the key thought that I think underlies many of our stories. And the kid who's watching should get that message. Am I part of the problem or part of the cure? Dated April 1994 and still relevant today. <laughs> we were working on a Saturday morning animated series, but it, it felt like we were making some amazingly deep episodic show every week because the, the content was so, was so unique and different. The tone was always set right from the start, and, and I think what was great about our little team is that, you know, Gary and myself and everybody else, we really wanted to do a compelling world. Every project, whether it was a theme park, a TV show, I mean, we wanted to make a place that was believable and interesting on its own right. So, you know, when we did Skeleton Warriors, we did it feeling like it was just as real as Captain Power or just as real as if we'd done a, you know, a documentary. We wanted the world to be complete, so we designed everything, we tried to think of everything, we tried to give a tone to everything, and we also made sure that the look told the same story in every angle. Um, that, that's the passion we brought to it. At the start of the show, I wanted to make sure we had a different look uh, than would be seen in a normal animated cartoon. We had a guy, a couple people actually working for us, but Greg Pro in particular, I thought had a really good color sense and a design sense. So we just went ahead and did some color styling, some color comps, the, the way you would do for a feature film almost. Let's have this area look like this, let's have that area look like that. You know, uh, the heroes are gonna be a little brighter, the uh, villains are gonna be a little darker, what color palettes are we gonna use. Setting up a set of inspiration sketches for the background artists and layout artists to look at. So not actual production designs, but more like uh, inspirational renderings that I hoped would kind of set a tone for the show. Skeleton Warriors became really a really simple thing, you know, the living dead kind of, you know, virtually, uh, against what's the opposite of, you know, the sinisterness of, of the Skeleton Warriors was family. So we created uh, the family light star. I miss father. You know what the expedition meant to him and to all of us. I just didn't know how hard it would be to be in charge. I can't even get through to my own brother. Maybe try trusting his judgment for a change. I mean, how dangerous could these friends of his be? What's it like when someone in your family is torn between the dark and the back? And what's that to save? The center of the show, in a lot of ways, was Grimskull's character, because he was a character that was on the edge of, of good or bad, light or dark. The decisions that he made, of course, uh, influenced and, and helped to create the situation that, that, uh, that uh, creates all the tension for the show. But now, um, his quest, his quest to right the wrongs and to, uh, you know, to find his place in the world. We would really have played the duality of the character. He was really going to become a driver to the second season. Uh, and we felt he was never exploited. I mean, it, was, it had a lot of depth to it, a lot of darkness. But we thought that was the show. We should have really gone for it. That's where we would have headed for the second season. Uncle Arsac, I can't fight him. 
Yes, you can, Josh. But he feeds on doubt. You must believe in yourself to overcome his influence. Grimskull is that character that kind of represents the good and bad in all of us. And so his arc was the most pivotal arc for a show that we were, you know, supposedly doing for kids. Um, and of course, all my shows weren't really just for kids. I, I subscribed to, you know, Walt Disney once said, well, someone actually, uh, an interviewer said to Walt Disney, well, you make all these movies for kids. And he said, I've never made a movie for kids. I'm, I make movies for the parents, and I put things in that I know the kids will like as well. And I think that's my story. I mean, really, we don't talk down to the kids. We aim high. The stories, the characters, I think, are the most interesting part. And of the characters, Grimskull is the most interesting character. And to me, he represented what is in all of us, the power to be good or bad, depending upon the decisions that we make. And so I think that as the story has developed, we would have focused more and more on him. And probably the ultimate resolution uh, of all of the story arcs, had we gone three or four or five seasons, would have been a resolution to the positive side of of Grimskull's character. All of our shows, the shows that I created, were supposed to go on and on and on for a while. And so uh, now what I want to do, I want to do one show where it actually does. We do get to take the arcs all the way and, and see these things through. Skeleton Warriors was always approached as being a multi-year, um, multi-episode series. And to that end, began to lay out what we thought would be groundwork for episodes down the road. Ending the first 13 with the ultimate uh, reuniting of the crystals and then after that, what happens? You know, which was a very exciting avenue to, to consider exploring. Whoever rules the crystal rules luminosity! Justin! Working in, in the field of animation, in terms of, of a show like Skeleton Warriors, the sound effects and the, and the what you're, sound that you're creating is bigger than life. It's, you're not trying to emulate the exact sound of an environment in real life. You're trying to make something bigger and more spectacular out of a, out of a fantasy world. The animation is coming in on a daily basis from overseas, and you're getting these little, these little clips, and it's edited together into sequences, and you're trying to stay with the schedule. So a composer is working on the music simultaneously while the sound designer is developing different moods and different, different landscapes and different environments for sound, and everybody is a part of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's just this beehive of activity, and as the show becomes more congealed and more edited, you get a rough cut, you get a final cut, then things start to settle in. In our case, we had a fully operational post-production facility uh, at Landmark, and so the music would get shot through cables right into the post-production room and fed into Pro Tools, and, and the sound designer is, is already developing effects. Dialogue is being uh, finished and sweetened and, and edited and is coming in, and all the elements are coming together. And by the end of the week, I mean, we had a mixed day, every Friday and on that Friday all the elements were there and we did our mix every week and BAM shows are sent out. Other would know what to do. You've wanted to lead us since the day you were born. Why aren't you out there waving your royal ring at everyone or does real responsibility terrify you? Was this to get back at me? Well it worked! I can't fix it! You can watch while I fail our people. There's a genuine advantage sitting here several years after the fact, after the one great season of Skeleton Warriors, to look back and, and try and parse out what didn't go right for the show. Looking back, there were issues. The series itself kind of got bumped around. I don't think we had three episodes in a row in the same time slot. I could be wrong about that, but uh, it got bounced around. And ultimately, um, the folks at Playmates who were handling the toy line created some amazing toys for the series. But a decision was made somewhere else in the pipeline. The first series of toys was limited to the bad guys. They did not release a good guy. So if you went to the store and you were a young person and you wanted to play Skeleton Warriors, you only could buy the bad guys. 
which was problematic. Just flat out, that was a problem. We were sculpting new concepts for new figures the whole time. We had, a, I think for the next year, we had a scorpion skeleton. I think we had a mummy skeleton. I think we had, uh, we had a double-headed, two-headed skeleton. I think we were looking for archetypes then. I think we had a Viking one. We were playing with a lot of ideas. We were also developing the playset, which uh, you kind of get a sense of in the show. And, and in one of our very first illustrations to sell the concept, we had a kind of a, a, a mountain that was that was in the shape of Viren Dark, kind of. And Baron Dark and his characters would fly out of that mountain and they were going to make a place out of that. We were actually working on sculpting of that entire thing. It was kind of like a volcano. So I went into my attic and I actually uh, went and discovered, found, one of the prototypes that we did for one of these new characters and I have it right here. So here we have the skeleton dragon, which actually, as you see here, uh, Baron Dark, here's the, here's the saddle. The wings would move, the tail would move, and you would be able to get this uh, with a Baron Dark figure that would sit atop. From this day forth, you are all more than you were before. Justin, with the fire of the crystal in your blood, you are now Prince Lightstar. Jennifer, because the crystal has given you the ability to fly, your new name shall be Talon. Talon? I like it. What do you think, Serafina? And me? What of me? You, Joshua. The crystal has selected you to bear the pain of your actions. Because you move within the shadows of darkness, you shall be called Grimskull. Grimskull. Yes. It is a name that suits me. And you, Uncle, shall be named Guardian. Your wisdom watches over us. We have so much to learn and so little time. There are people with a lot of fond memories of this show. There are very vocal fans for Skeleton Warriors out there. It's just been very gratifying to, to learn that there are people who have very, very fond, strong memories of that one shining season of Skeleton Warriors. When a, a core group, a creative team, works together over many projects in many years, you start to, uh, you start to have this sixth sense uh, about, about what's good, what works. We got pretty good at, at figuring out what Gary, what Gary liked and what he didn't like. It was really a very healthy uh, a collaboration that we had over the years. It was an amazing experience. It was like, like a family. And you could be working on a theme park attraction one day or you could be working on a toy line another day or a kids TV program. It was just really fun. We had an amazing time. We had an amazing time together. It was really a little bit of Camelot. I mean, for a brief period of time there, we had so much talent all built around Gary. And uh, Gary would have these ideas and a lot of us would help him develop the ideas and we'd run off, we'd produce these ideas. And it was amazing. We were doing, you know, high-end theme park attractions, television shows like Skeleton Warriors. Before that, Gary had done Captain Power. We were at the tip of the iceberg. Had we produced these shows ourselves, there would be a legacy now of material, a library of things we'd created. Skeleton Warriors would just be just a very small piece of it. Skeleton Warriors was uh, a noble experiment and a show where we uh, created very strong villains and then a small, small team of unique heroes that would battle against them. It's the same story that's always told, just like the hero with a thousand faces, but in a different way. The overall story is still very strong. Each one was really a moral tale of one kind or another. And uh, I think that was what we wanted to uh, achieve in terms of the storytelling. It was a unique show for its time. Uh, I think it's actually still unique. I don't think anything's really been done that's like it. I'm glad we did it. And I would love to see it with the technology of today, bringing those characters to life in a kind of a 3D animation format. I think it would be great. If those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it, what of those who already know their future? Never underestimate the future. It's all we have to look forward to. <laughs>